Try to imagine a moment when you're happy. You feel a love and everything in your life is going extremely well. Your career is thriving and you're surrounded by friends and family who bring a lot of joy in your life. Then, all of a sudden, out of the blue, life throws a curveball at you, pushing you out of your comfort zone big time. You find yourself struggling with stress, feelings of anxiety or even depression. Panic sets in, you ruminate, and the nostalgia of better times is haunting you. This pit you've fallen into feels like a limbo between two phases. But it is precisely these disturbing feelings that ignite a spark within you to, to search for a way out. You realize that to escape this pit, you have to work diligently to reinvent yourself, to evolve, and to adapt. And when you finally do, it's like this eureka moment, this aha that signifies your ability to stretch beyond your limits, to overcome your demons and grow. This journey, dear people, is what anthropologists call liminality, a phase where what once was no longer is and the future you desire for has not yet arrived. This phase is marked by chaos and resistance as we navigate the in-between. But what if we accept this liminality? What if we, instead of longing for stability and abundance, that we embrace liminality as part of our solution? What if we accept that this is as good as it gets? What if we evolve our mindset as individuals and organizations, preparing ourselves to continuously adapt and reset? Unfortunately, we're not really there yet. Stress and burnout continue to rise, and many people are in a sort of bois de vivre, instead of a choix de vivre, signaling to us that we must urgently adopt new ways of thinking, living, and working. So let us ask ourselves, are we ready to accept this new now and make liminality an ally in our pursuit for personal and collective growth? With my background in neuroscience, I'm convinced that in order to pursue that growth, we need to invest in what makes us unique as human beings, and that is our brain. We need to empower our brain, and it is about time. We are in the midst of a brain crisis. With that very smart brain of ours, we've created a world in which we actually cannot follow anymore, at least not at the pace that we would like to, and that is giving us so much stress. Take a look at the amount of information online every minute of the day. One way of thinking about this is that we're drinking from a fire hose. There's too much coming at us. We're soaked in information. It's infobesity. Wherever we go, in restaurants or maybe at your own dining table, in schools, in offices, it has become really hard for us to be right here, right now. We've all become smombies. You know that word? It's a fantastic combination, smartphone zombies, smombies. Sometimes I do wonder, dear people, whether the motto of our era should be, I try to live, but I got distracted. How would that look like on our tombstone? In the short term, we may be distracted from doing the things we want to do, but in the longer term, however, we may be distracted from living the lives we want to live, or even worse. It may undermine our capacity for reflection, making it harder to want what we want to want. To want what we want to want. How will this evolve in the future? 
take a look, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook and Meta, standing in a room full with people who are all wearing virtual de reality devices. He is the only person standing in actual reality, smiling, walking around proudly. Is this a metaphor for the future? For our future? If we do not change course, we're headed towards a world where a selected few know very well about the scarcity of attention resources, and the rest, with fewer resources to resist, will live more and more in their screens. Which consequences will that have for our brains? Today, I want to share you my insights from neuroscience about how you can react resiliently in a time where change seems to be the only constant, in a time where we allow ourselves to, to live on automatic pilot instead of sitting firmly in our driver's seat, in a time where we seem to follow our life instead of leading it. What can you do, what should you do in a time that looks like a continuous learning pit? I believe that in order to boost our resilience, we need to invest in two qualities. One is the ability to focus on what really matters, and the other is our ability to connect with ourselves, with the people around us, so we, we feel belongingness to a community. Focus is often called the new IQ. You might be as smart as Einstein, but if you do not succeed to focus on what really matters, how relevant is that high IQ? Let's take a look at you. In the past week, think about it. How often have you been able to focus on your priorities? Think about it. And how often have you been multitasking? In fact, when people think they're doing several things at once, they're switching back and forth. It feels like multitasking, but our brain cannot multitask. Also not the female brain. It's a myth. We cannot do it. Research clearly shows that when you multitask, you'll be slower, you'll make more mistakes, you'll be less creative, and you remember less of what you do. So there is no alternative. If you want to do things well, you need to pay attention at one thing at a time. Did you know that the size and capacity of the human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years? Yet we're deluded about this fact. The average teen and the young adult generally believe that they can follow six or seven forms of media all at the same time. We are not machines. We cannot live by the logic of machines. We are humans and we function differently. Luckily, we all can make progress in this as our brain is like a muscle. We can start small by installing micro habits. Suppose you struggle with focus then start single tasking for 10 minutes and then allow yourself one minute of distraction and then 10 minutes of single tasking again and so on. As you do it, it will become more familiar and your brain will get better and better at it. And pretty soon, you will be able to do it for 15 minutes, 20 minutes and so on. So just do it. Practice. Start small, but practice, and you will soon find out how you can empower your brain. So installing these microhabits is essential to regain focus. But it is also about building the right context so that you can go for something all the way. And let me share with you one technique to help you get started. It has to do with this statement. When you're hunting elephants, don't get distracted chasing rabbits. Of course, metaphorically, I'm a big animal lover, but here the elephant represents the important task, the priority that you need to chase strategically with 100% of your attention. It's not lying in front of your feet. You have to come up with a plan. And the rabbits, they stand for anything that distracts you from that task. I don't know what your rabbits are, but Mine are emails, phone calls, video calls, text messages, and messages, have you read my email? 
I bet you two on most days start your day by opening up your rabbit hutch. And there they jump out, those cute little bunnies all over the place. And you think, let me start with this, and I already covered this and that, and then we take our to-do list and we do the small to-dos first, because hey, then I can already check them, I'm doing really well today. Think about it. With that fresh brain of yours that just had a night's sleep, you're chasing little rabbits. And by the time you have your elephant in sight, your brain is already too tired and you conclude, I'm going to do it in the afternoon. By which time, of course, your rabbit hutch is full again. But around 4, 5, 6 p.m., you have a brilliant idea. The elephant, I'm going to do it tomorrow. But of course, tomorrow, as we are creatures of habit, you will start again with the rabbits. And the elephant stays on your to-do list. That gives stress. But what is more is that you are all way too clever to only chase rabbits. You need elephants to feel inspired in life, to create meaning in life, to sense motivation in whatever learning pit you may be. So, think about what your elephants are. Try to visualize them and try to start as often as possible your day with an elephant. Try tomorrow. Even if it's just for half an hour, start with an elephant. And you will notice that because of the good feelings it creates, that you'll work through your rabbit hutch much more smoothly without procrastination, because you're not anticipating that elephant anymore. It's the same amount of work, but the dynamics are totally different. And so will your sense of accomplishment. See what this could do for you and experience how you, again, can want what you want to want. Now, parallel to focus, there is also an emotional component that is vital for your resilience, and that is connection. Connection to yourself, but also connection to the people around you. It will help you to have a good life. Now, to have a good life, many people think, I just remove what's wrong with it. But that's not enough. Many of us try to seek relief from distractions simply by crashing. They try to recover after a day of work, of overload, by collapsing in front of the TV. Kind of ready, set, binge. But if you only break away from distraction and to rest and don't replace it with a positive goal you're striving towards, you will always be pulled back to distraction sooner or later. I'm convinced that the more powerful path out of distraction is to find your purpose. Think about it. What is your purpose? What is your reason of being? What is the reason that you get up in the morning? If I visit companies, there's always a clear mission statement, and often the values are painted on the walls. But I rarely encounter individuals who have a clear idea about their own mission statement. How about you? Do you get up in the morning and lead your life based on your purpose? Or are you trying to live and get distracted? I personally rely upon three questions that I ask myself every night before I go to bed. Three questions from late psychiatrist Luc Isebart, a key figure in solution-focused therapy, who said that these questions help you to choose for a happy life. What did I do today that I'm satisfied with? What did someone else do for me that I liked? And what did I hear, see, feel, smell, taste that I enjoyed? Think about it. Do you think it's plausible that your answer to this would be, ooh, today I was so satisfied that I got distracted by my smartphone for two hours? No, of course not. By asking yourself these questions daily, you will discover a common thread in your answers and become much more aware of what makes you tick. See what it could do for us, what it could do for you, to get familiar with it. We need that compass, all of us. It's vital to know what makes us tick, so we can lead our life and we can choose what we want to want. Now, aside from connection with yourself, 
I'm convinced it's also very important in times of liminality, especially, to be connected to the people around you, that you feel that you belong to a community. But that belonging can only be accomplished when you feel safe. Safe to be yourself, safe to take risks, safe to dwell on the learning pit for a while. Basically, it comes down to this. We should feel safe to try to fail to learn and again. Fail fast, learn faster. In every team, there should be room to try and to fail and to learn from that. Psychological safety is not a nice to have, but a must have. Growth and success are closely related to being allowed and daring to fail. So if you want to succeed in the new now, and if you want to succeed with your teams in the new now, this should be the standard stance in your teams, at school, at work, and at home. Be mild to people who are going through learning pits. See how you can help each other out and how you can show solidarity, and above all, be mild to yourself. When you notice that team members want to challenge the status quo or uh, share a different perspective, make sure that they feel free and safe to speak up. It will create authentic, true connection, adding to the collective resilience and brain power of your team. Remember, focus is the new IQ, but also keep in mind that connection is the new EQ. Try to create your focus and find your connection. You both need them. Now, try to imagine that life throws a curveball at you. And try to appreciate these liminal times as an ally in your journey to whatever reset you may want to make. Try to find out the discomfort maybe even prolong it for a while so you can properly assess where you will guide your life and find out what you want to want. Taking ownership of your life is not just about decisions you make today, it's a lifelong journey. Resetting resiliently is not something you do once, but over and over again. Remember, dear people, that your brain is the key to success and focus and connection are the new intelligence.